It's that kind of day. I grabbed the wrong, uh, the wrong book. I'll go get it after I do the announcements. What? My, my office is locked out. You, you need money. Uh, everybody has a key to my office. <laughs> no, here we go. There, the, that one. Uh, yeah, that's the one for choir. Now, welcome. Good. It's good to see all of you here. We're so glad you could join us today. We always begin our service by saying no matter who you are or who I am and the mistakes that I constantly make, that everyone is welcome here. And we're so glad that you could join us. We are a church that where we always begin by saying uh, that love comes first. Love of neighbor, love of children, and love of creation. And speaking of uh, love of children, we're so glad to welcome today the family of Julia Rose Brown, her father and mother, and all of her family that has joined us for this special day of baptism. Welcome. We hope you guys feel the welcome of our church and, and the love from this church family. Also, there will uh, be, uh, from what I remember in our meetings, that, I mean, from our uh, announcements that I, was, that I had written down, that there is a um, potluck, pumpkin potluck, next uh, week. And we hope that all of you will join us and you can read it about it in our bulletin. Also, that our nurse will be, um, our nurses will be, um, Thank you. Our nurse will be taking blood pressures, and I probably should be first in line today um, uh, upstairs in Upper Packard Hall. And we'd like to invite all of you afterwards, if you'd like to join us in Upper Packard Hall for a fellowship. Uh, let's now prepare our hearts for worship. Oh no, before he starts, I have one more announcement. I just got mixed up with everything. Somebody had their 29th birthday yesterday, and I think we should sing happy birthday to him, and that's Dr. Joe. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Dr. Happy birthday to you. I, I was just kidding. It's not uh, 29. It's actually 49. So. It's actually 78. <laughs> I can't lie about it anymore.
Thank you, Dr. Joe. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has entered our human village. Jesus has entered. Have mercy on us. Jesus comes to heal and make clean. Jesus has entered. Have mercy on us. Jesus hears your voices and sees your hearts. Take comfort in knowing that Jesus is nature to be full of love and always show mercy. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, our first hymn will be Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, number 16 in the Chalice Hymnal, and please rise in body or spirit. <laughs> Celebrate the sacrament of baptism. at our church, uh, we will be celebrating um, All Saints Day. And uh, we celebrate that day that the saints are with us and join us in worship. And today we have some uh, pictures up here that I'm going to let you tell who they are who are joining us for this special occasion. So you can just speak into here. My uncle Esteban, my grandma Julia, who Julia is named after, and my great aunt Esperanza. And we believe that they are here as well. 
as we share in this baptism today. Following the tradition of Jesus, who welcomed children into his community, we celebrate the presence of children within this community of faith and offer to them the sacrament of baptism. In baptism, we celebrate the love of God made known in our children. We also affirm the sacredness of the covenant shared between our children, their parents, and this congregation to support our children as they grow and mature in faith. This first question is for the, pap for the parents. After that, all the rest of the questions are for all of you, of you. Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. Will you teach this child that she so that she has an appreciation for the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, that she may be led to profess Jesus as Lord and Savior? If so, we say we do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, we do. We do. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow with this child in the Christian faith? To help her to be a faithful member of the church of Jesus Christ and to walk in godly ways and to offer her the nurture of the Christian church so that she may affirm her baptism. If so, say we do. We do. Jesus calls us to welcome children into the full life of our community opening our hearts to those most vulnerable, offering the wisdom of the ages to all who hunger for truth. Do you, congregation, who witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise your love, support, and care to this child being baptized as she lives and grows in this Christian community? We do. We promise our love, support, and care. I would ask you all to rise. I invite you to respond to the historic affirmation of faith used at the time of baptism since the early days of the Christian church. Do you believe in God? I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation made known to us in water and word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters and out of the waters of the deep, you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth. In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and cross the flowing Jordan to enter into the promised land. You have come to us through water and the stories of Jesus who nurtured, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb, baptized by John in the water of the Jordan and became living water to the woman at the Samaritan well. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and sent them forth to baptize with water and the spirit. Bless by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, God this water. May, may she create new life in the one baptized today, that she may rise in Christ. And may, all, and may we all ever be reminded of your abiding presence and claim in our lives. Amen. By what name will your child be called? Can I take her now? Will you come to me? You may be seated.
Hello, dear. There's your mom right there. See? It's okay. Yeah. I baptize you, Julia Rose Brown, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. The Holy Spirit be upon you, child of God, disciple of Christ, and member of Christ Church. Amen. Let us stand and praise God. and this child come together making covenant promises. We ask that you would give to the newly baptized strength for the journey, courage in time of suffering, and joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life through Jesus Christ who makes us one. Amen. On behalf of the members of the First Congregational Church, we welcome your child into the life and community and love of this church family. In honor of this holy occasion, we would like to do this for you. We'd like to dip this rose in the water of baptism and allow you to keep it, perhaps dry it and keep it forever as a symbol of our love for your child. And here is your baptismal certificate. Thank you. We welcome you. You are a beautiful young lady and we welcome you. And, and I want to say, although she has all those aunts and uncles out there, she has new ones now. Yes. A new family that she's part of. So thank you. May God bless you all. May God bless you all. You may be seated now, all of you. All of you. God bless you.
Let us pray. Holy One, you have called us out of bondage. And you have called us to follow you. You have called us to leave behind everything and move toward the future, a future that can seem frightening, especially as it takes us to new places we've never been before, new ways of doing things that we've never done before, to meet new people, especially people who are different from us. You are always calling us forward. We ask today that you'd help us to keep our attention on you, especially when the circumstances around us seem to be rocky and frightening. Help us to keep our eyes on you who are the author and the finisher of our faith. We come praying this morning once again for the people in Florida, North and South Carolina. But we also want to lift up the people of Puerto Rico and Cuba, who were also hit by this devastating hurricane. We lift up those who now feel so downhearted. We lift up those who have given up hope. We have asked that you would help us to once again dig deep and help those in need in our community, in our nation, and in our world. We also pray this morning for peace not only for Ukraine, but for the whole world. And once again, I dare to pray for President Putin that he would have an epiphany, that he would come to his senses, that he would stop before bringing destruction not only to himself, his country, but to the whole world. We pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. That we will put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure to which you get back. Would the ushers please come forward to receive the tithes and the offerings?
dedication found in your bulletin. Giver and sustainer of life, pour out your blessing upon these gifts and upon all who give from their hearts. Multiply them so they reach farther than our imaginations can carry them. In the blessed name of our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading today is from Jeremiah 29, 1, 4 to 7. It can be found in the Pew Bible, page 717. <coughs> These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests the prophets and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that may bear sons and daughters multiply there and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where i have sent you into exile and pray to the lord on its behalf and for its welfare you will find your welfare There was nothing but destruction. Nothing but destruction, friends, in Jerusalem at this time. In fact, if you want to know what Jerusalem looked like, it probably looked like Fort Myers, totally devastated, ruins everywhere. Um, even the temple had been totally destroyed. And what people that, that they could take, they took as, as captives um, to, to Babylon, which was a thousand miles away. They had, they had killed the heir, the one son of the king. So they had also gouged out the eyes of the king. So many people had died of starvation, trying to hold them off. Uh, but, uh, and, and the ones, and, and if you survived, friends, going to, uh, go, if you survived uh, them ransacking and pillaging the city, you may not have survived the trip of a thousand miles of walking as captives. To Babylon. In fact, that's why um, Jeremiah starts this letter out by saying to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar has taken into exile from Jerusalem. What he was saying was to whoever's left. Whatever priests are left, whatever leaders are left, we're not sure. Everything was in disarray. Nobody knew who, if, if they even had family that had made it this far. They were still trying to figure things out. They were still in shock. And they were hurt. And they were hopeless. And when you're hurt and you're hopeless and you're angry, a lot of times you will listen to the wrong people. People who give you false hope. You see, there were prophets and leaders in Israel, I mean, in uh, Babylon, who had come along with them, who were saying, thus saith the Lord, God is going to send his Messiah. 
his uh, anointed leader who was going to destroy the city of Babylon and deliver us and bring us back to Israel. So Jeremiah wrote this letter to whoever was left and was, had some very harsh words for them. He said, not so. In fact, you're never going back. Your grandchildren may one day go back, but you won't. Uh, but one thing is there's nothing to go back to. There was nothing left in Israel for them. He also was saying that God was not back in Israel in the temple, not even in the temple. God was now in Babylon with them, which was a whole new way of thinking about things because they really had this tribal idea about God that the God of Israel lived in the land of Israel. I mean, God lived in, in Jerusalem, the city of God. They didn't think, it wasn't because of the horrible things that had happened. They just didn't think that God would be in Babylon. Uh, their gods would be in Babylon. And their gods were false gods. And, but they still didn't believe that God was with them. He says, you're not going back. You're staying here. This is your home now. So then he tells them this. Well, here's what I would, you would have seen on the screen if the screen had worked today. It, it would have said that you are to build houses or build homes and not tents. You see, a tent is, is for um, someone who's staying somewhere temporary. A house is for someone who's planning to stay there for good. He was telling them, build houses, plant gardens, use your gifts. It, whatever trade you have, use it. Build a, a, a life. And then he goes on to say, not only that, but he says this. He says, take wives and, so and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give them your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. And if you notice, he's talking about two generations. He says, you are to take wives and have sons and daughters. And then your sons and daughters are to get married as well and have children. You're going to be here a while. And what he's telling them as well is not only are you to not to build a home instead of a tent, you are to build a home instead of a house. You see, a home is where babies are born, where people get married where children grow up, where the elderly are taken care of and may even die there. A home is a place where you build a life, a community life, a life of people who are faithful to the God of Israel. This is going to be your spiritual home. And actually, this is the time when the focus of worship, if you, I, I remember talking to a Jewish person here in the community who was converted to Judaism. And she says, what I loved about it is that the focus of worship was in the home, not even in the synagogue. The focus, there was no longer a temple. The home became the focus of the spiritual life of the Jewish people. But, he won't, but what Jeremiah is saying is, forget about what you've heard. Forget about what they say. And you're going to be here a very long time. And you need to let go of the past. You need to let go of your nostalgia, your dream of going back to Jerusalem. Because there's nothing to go back to. 
And God isn't back there. God is here with you and has a future for you here. And then Jeremiah says, I think the hardest thing of all, I mean, something that I would have had a hard time swallowing. He says, seek the welfare of the city. And not only seek the welfare, but he goes on. Where he says, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, let's just think about seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of the people who have come and destroyed your country, who have killed your sisters and brothers, raped your daughters and your mothers, who have destroyed the place where God dwelt and taken away with them uh, the, the most holy relics in the temple that had been there since the time of Solomon. He says, I want you to seek the welfare of this place. You have to realize it wasn't just what had happened, but what happened every day as they were second class citizens. And that's why building that home was so important and, and, and using their gifts and trades to make a life for themselves was so important because they, like a lot of other countries that had been been taken over by Babylon, were second-class citizens. And people made fun of them. And not only made fun of them, but made fun of their faith. I think it's Psalm 137 where the writer of the psalm says, they, they told us in mirth, sing the songs of Zion. In laughter, they told us to sing the songs of joy that we sang in Zion to our God, making fun of them, making fun of their faith, making fun of their God. But yet God was saying to them in the midst of that, I want you to seek the welfare of these people. I want you to pray to our God on behalf of this city. Why? Well, first of all, this is now your home. This is home, not where you were. Second of all, by your prayers, you're going to show these people that they are as dependent on the God of Israel as Israel was. And the God is not in one place, but God encompasses now the whole world. And they need to pray for the welfare of the city because they're dependent on God in the same way that the people of Israel are now dependent on the welfare of Babylon. In fact, the welfare of Babylon will determine the welfare of the people of Israel. This was their home. This was where they would stay. I was thinking about what it's like or what I, yeah, in, in my life, I have moved many times. Uh, and even good moves, friends, moves to places I, you know, that were turned out to be wonderful places. It was still hard. I still was often homesick for the place I left. Still thought about, still trying to make new friends, I, I, trying to build a new life where I am. Often, even if it was the same country, the same place, I still sometimes felt like a foreigner, like I was on the outside. Honestly, I can't imagine what it would be like if I was really, if I had desperately run away from a group of people who had wanted to kill me, possibly a gang, seeking refuge and had come to this country and uh, was treated terribly. 
Now this isn't a sermon about politics and, our, and what you think about um, our immigration policies. We have to do some work on that. All I'm saying is that when we run into immigrants, we should always treat them with compassion. I think there's another kind of, of, how do I put this? I think that a lot of us feel like refugees in another way. Refugees of time. Refugees of modernity. It's not like we felt like we moved to a new place, but it feels like the place moved. It feels like the world moved. It feels like everything moved and everything changed and we're still here. But everything seems foreign to us, different, new. And we pine for those days back for the way it used to be, before you could say our devastation, which was COVID. I was looking at a picture I put up on Facebook um, that was taken five years ago. And when you looked out at the, it was a picture that was taken of the bottom part of the sanctuary and it was packed with people. And when I saw that, I really was homesick for what it was like five years ago before all this happened. But the word of God that God is speaking to me today is I can't go back there any more than the people of Israel could go back to Jerusalem. And nostalgia does nothing, friends, but really just take away our faith in the present and what God wants for the future. Because where God is, is right here, right now, in the present circumstances that we are all facing and the situations that we are facing. This is where we'll meet God and not what happened five or 25 years ago, any more than God was there in Babylon and not back in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. God was meeting them right there. I'd like to finish with a story. A story that was, uh, it's really a parable that was, um, that was told by a, a psychiatrist by the name of David Hawkins. And he would often talk about the, um, he'd talk about the vibration of people. He'd say, you know, there are people with very high vibration, and I take those very spiritual people, uh, and there are people at a very low vibration. And he told the story of two men who were shipwrecked on this island and, uh, and um, left in this most remote part of, of, of the Pacific, where it would be a long shot if anyone found them, but one of them sat on the water waiting for another ship to come and rescue him and take him back home. Whereas the other man went into the village where there were some natives. And he got to know the village and the village helped him to build a hut. So he built this hut to live in and he got to know the villagers and, and got to know them well and learned their language, and pretty soon uh, he realized that these, um, these native people um, had all these scars on their feet because they went around barefooted all the time. So he found a way to create a sandal that would help their feet. Pretty soon this guy had a, a good sandal um, business going where he was se selling sandals like crazy and he was becoming rather prosperous. And then he started a coconut business. And this guy was doing very well. And then he became, and then he met this beautiful woman and he married her. She became, uh, and, uh, and, and he had a very prosperous and wonderful life. 
But the other guy was still waiting at the water, pining for home, just waiting for that ship that's going to come one day and rescue him. And the question I want to ask you in closing is, which one are you? Which man are you? The one on the shore? Or the one who went and made a life? Would you join me in singing our closing hymn? And would you rise in either body or spirit to sing, To God Be the Glory, hymn number 72. Before I uh, give the benediction, I just want to say that our, um, our confirmation information class will be right down here in about 15 minutes. 
and we'll get chairs and we'll put them out. We'll, we'll get some chairs from upstairs and we'll be meeting in here for, the, for, that, for our class today. Would you bow your heads for the benediction? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you. Amen.